Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for the National Conference of State Legislatures webinar, Energy Equity and Affordability, State Policy Action. My name is Glenn Anderson, and I'm the Energy Policy Director at NCSL, and will be moderating today's webinar. Today's webinar will um, er, provides you a platform for information exchange and engagement, and over the next 60 minutes, we encourage participation through our chat box. So feel free to type your questions in or provide um, or look for providing answers to other questions that others may pose in the chat box on the screen. To familiarize yourself with the chat functions, um, feel free to type in the state with which you are calling from um, and to promote some interaction. And you are welcome to send questions for speakers through the chat box at any time. They will be answered after the three pre presentations conclude. The webinar is being recorded and links for the recording and presentation slides will be sent out once those resources are made available. Additionally, you can download the presentation slides immediately by clicking the resources tab. Um, today's webinar explores a number of uh, increasingly important issues and concerns that many states are facing as a growing number of energy consumers uh, are finding challenge in paying their energy bills due to economic hardships. The webinar will explore this critical issue and some of the steps that policymakers are taking to leverage energy efficiency policy in order to create more affordable and equitable energy solutions. And today we really are honored to have some distinguished speakers and uh, both experts and leaders in this topic who will be discussing the various uh, steps that have been taken across the U.S. and some of the different states that are leading in this area. First up, uh, we will have Lauren Ross, who manages the local policy program at the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, where she focuses on local implementation of energy efficiency. She is the lead on ACEEE's work to expand policies and programs to improve energy use in underserved and under-resourced communities with an emphasis on affordable housing. So let's welcome Lauren. So Laura, uh, Lauren, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Glenn. And um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for the invitation to present. I'm really excited um, to be in front of this audience and it's not often that I have um, state policy, that I'm speaking to state policymakers. So I'm excited um, for today's conversation on the topic of energy equity and affordability. And we'll, I'll be concluding with some thoughts on state policy action. And for those of you uh, maybe unfamiliar um, with ACEEE, we are a, well, we are the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy. We're a nonprofit research organization dedicated to advancing energy efficiency in the U.S. And we focus on efficiency in, in, a, in a number of sectors, um, including buildings, transportation, industry. And then we also focus on policy, um, including national, state, local and utility policy. I'm on the local policy team. I lead our city's work at ACEEE, and I have a strong emphasis on low-income communities and furthering equitable energy efficiency, which you'll see reflected in my presentation today. And just a, quickly a little bit more on ACEEE. Um, you all may know us because of our state energy efficiency scorecard. We've been doing that over, I think, 10 years now where we focus on all aspects of state policy as it relates to furthering energy efficiency across buildings, utilities, transportation, um, and the list goes on. But that's one of the resources we have um, for, for state um, actors, as well as a, a bunch of research that um, is geared towards the state audience. Some of that including um, research focused on energy efficiency resource standards, state freight planning, um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions through efficiency programs, more and more on electrification. Um, and we, we 
offer policy guidance documents, I guess you could say, but we also do deep technical work too. So please look to us to be a resource in furthering any of your efforts in this space. So I'll begin by just briefly talking about the problem of energy affordability, energy equity, defining that a bit. Um, and then quickly in terms of my overall presentation today, I want to, as I said, look at the problem, tell you how us as an organization have, I have worked to study and examine the problem of energy affordability, look at some of the causes and impacts, and then really focus on the role of energy efficiency as a strategy to combat um, high energy burdens, and then some of the, again, implications for state policy. So to start with, I want to talk about the intersection of equity and energy, which I think hits home for a lot of people when it's time to pay monthly utility bills. You know, for instance, our research shows that low-income households, as well as community of colors, the elderly, renters, all face disproportionately high energy burdens, devoting more of their income to energy costs compared to their, their counterparts. Um, these houses also, as I have noted here, um, often lack energy efficiency services and technology. Um, and, you know, the discretionary, the, the discretionary capital to invest in these types of um, products and services and, and, and um, have often been overlooked, um, underrepresented in those who participate in energy efficiency programs. And they also um, are underrepresented in the energy efficiency workforce. Um, and I think that's an important component when we're looking at the whole range of energy equity. And these are just some of the ways that inequity really undercuts the energy efficiency sector. Um, and the thing I should note before moving on that it's, it's a result of a cumulative impact of underserving low-income communities and communities of color when it comes to clean energy um, resources, as well as limited housing choices. Um, limiting housing choices to inadequate structures and vulnerable land, which, you know, it's, it's a legacy of disinvestment, which really accounts for um, high energy cost. So most of what I'm going to talk about today comes out of research that I've done at ACCIE on the topic of energy burdens. Um, when we say energy burdens here, we're, we're talking, what we're, we're referring to is um, the percent of household income that's spent on home energy bills. In this case, electricity, natural gas, or other heating fuels. Now, transportation, um, fuel, and water can certainly be considered um, or included in one's energy burden, but we didn't include it in our study. Um, so I just want to note that. And then on average, we see that energy burdens um, are about 3% 3, 3, um, percent across the U.S., um, and to put that into perspective, researchers identify unaffordable energy burdens as above 6% and then severe burdens as above 10%. Um, there's no hard science on this, but in the literature and, and those that are studying energy insecurity, energy affordability, we usually use that as markers. It feels a little strange not being able to hear any dialogue or questions, but as Glenn said, please, you know, think of any questions you have and, and we can discuss those at the end. Um, so on to some of the causes of high energy burdens. Um, just want to quickly come, cover some of the, the major causes um, or a, kind of a useful way through um, of thinking through them is some of the physical causes like inefficient systems, inefficient HVAC systems, poor insulation, air sealing. Um, economic factors such as crowding or sudden economic hardship, some of the high upfront costs associated with efficiency. Policy factors, insufficient or inaccessible bill, bill assistance programs, um, insufficient, in, insufficient funding for weatherization. Um, and then there's behavioral factors um, like lack of information about programs or conservation measures. Um, and then also, um, climate, and I think we've I've seen this a lot in the news lately, of the intersection of, of high energy bills and extreme heat. Um, most of us know that um, climate change is leading to patterns and frequency and, and longer durations of heat waves, 
And when you couple that with high energy burdens that are already unsustainable, it's really leading to death weight outcomes um, in a lot of areas with persistent extreme heat. And then in terms of impacts, high energy burdens have been found to lead to increased stress, health impacts such as respiratory diseases. Um, children have been reported having, neg having um, negative impact on health as well and education. And it also perpetuates cycles of poverty. You know, there's higher instances of disconnections, um, which could lead to reliance on um, payday lending, and, you know, which, again, perpetuates that cycle of poverty. So in terms of what this problem looks like national, it is, I think I should probably first state, it is a national problem. One-fourth of U.S. households have a high energy burden, which the, the number there is um, almost 31 million households. And more than two-thirds of low-income households have a high energy burden. Um, and we see this nationally. Again, I say this is a national problem, but we see these patterns play out at the state level across states, in every state, across every region. Um, you know, you'll, you'll see, I think, one of my slides, it, sometimes it's higher in, in some regions versus others, but the idea is that these patterns play out that, you know, this, this um, two-thirds of low-income households facing disproportionate energy costs and these high burdens really is a national and state-level issue as well. So in terms of our, our first energy burden study, um, I just want to put some numbers to what I'm discussing here. We looked at metro areas. Um, so we looked at the 50 largest metro areas in addition to some national data. And really, for the first time, we used a national study to look at the landscape of energy burdens across the U.S. Um, and we found that the median low-income household energy burden was more than, was more than twice as high um, at around 7.2% and three times greater um, than higher income households. Um, to show you the discrepancy, higher income households were, um, I think the median energy burden was 2.3%. And again, compared to low income households, that's 7.2%. Um, but overall, low income households experienced the highest median energy burden, um, followed by black households, Latinx households, um, renting households. Um, low-income multifamily households. These are some of the um, vulnerable groups, I guess, that we first acknowledged or identified in our study. And again, since then, we continue um, to see these patterns play out and even deepen um, in the face of extreme inequality. This, these numbers I'm presenting today are based on 2016 data or a 2016 report, but I should know that um, we have a report coming out in a month that updates all of this data. Of course, the story is still the same, but you could see um, just a more um, recent look at, at the um, distribution of energy burdens across the U.S. And I'll say in terms of the rural energy burdens, I won't go through all the groups here, but in that research, some things that stuck out to me were um, the burden that manufactured residents of manufactured housing face when it comes to high energy costs. These units are also found to be highly inefficient. Um, and so I think that this was a good example of a sector that could really use some targeted interventions. Um, and in general, rural, we found that rural households um, faced higher burdens than, than metro households. And, you know, Obviously, I'm deep in the energy efficiency world, but there is a lack of investment in efficiency in, in rural areas. And I, I like to think that the, that telling this story um, has brought more attention for um, state energy offices that are now focusing more so on um, the upgrading of the rural housing stock um, for this reason. And then I promise this is the last kind of number heavy um, table, but um, I show this slide in particular because when we talk about medians, sometimes it, it doesn't really tell the whole story, right? We're looking at the average household. It's good to look at the differences between groups, but we don't really see how bad is the problem. And this um, table that I have here is helpful, or I should say graph is helpful, in that it shows the quartiles of, of energy burdens. And here, if you look at the right-hand column, 
you see the upper quartile. And what this means, and I kind of have it spelled out here on the top, hopefully it's not too small for you. But if you look at the right-hand column, it states that 25% of low-income households have energy burdens higher than the numbers listed here. Let me see, two examples I could pull out is that a quarter of low-income households in Baltimore experience a burden greater than 22%. And a quarter of households in Detroit experience an energy burden greater than 19%. Um, this is a quarter of all low-income households. So it's a large portion of the population paying, you know, upwards of 20% of their income um, towards energy costs. And so, again, medians are useful for understanding some of the inequities, but kind of overshadow how bad and severe the problem really is for certain groups. So where does efficiency fit in? Um, you know, I, I, I don't think this is a question or, or really a conversation much about the merits of bill assistance for, versus efficiency. Bill assistance is a, certainly a needed resource for families, but efficiency is more of the long-term solution to high energy burdens. Um, you know, it's upgrading the ha housing stock, stock for long-term affordability. Um, and the wonderful thing about efficiency is that it, offer, it offers multiple benefits to households. There's more and more research coming out about the relationship between energy efficiency and indoor health benefits. Um, and and um, to quickly tie it back to energy burdens, as I have it here, our research has found that um, basic weatherization can lower energy burdens by about 25%. And then, of course, there's additional benefits, too. In, in addition to indoor health, there's you know, benefits to the environment, reducing GHGs, and of course, job creation and local job creation, right? Um, efficiency, if this, you can't really um, contract or outsource efficiency, efficiency jobs. It's usually capturing um, the workforce that is within state boundaries. So that's why we look to efficiency as a resource here. And then I, I want to cover. Um, some of the opportunities for state policy. We don't have time today to go through all of these in detail, but I want to make a few key points, and then you have my contact information. We have bunches of re a bunch of resources um, for you all, so feel free if you want to dig deeper into any of this. Um, we have more resources than you could imagine where we produce a lot of reports. Um, so some of the, the main points here um, that I'd like to highlight are that as we produce this energy burden research and we see how it, it really helps, um, I think, policymakers, the general public understand the relationship um, or, or it makes efficiency more tangible and, and, and its implications. And I think a, a, a new, um, the opportunity that exists for state policy right now is to begin developing efficiency or even more broadly clean energy policies that speak to energy affordability goals, track progress on reducing energy burdens. And we are actually seeing um, more and more states and cities um, begin to identify efficiency as a key strategy to lowering energy burdens. So they're developing energy efficiency and clean energy strategies with the goal of addressing energy burden. Um, right now, those six states include Colorado, New Jersey, New York, Oregon, Pennsylvania, and Washington. They have all set energy burden-focused policies, goals, or programs with energy efficiency as a key component. And this is a very new development that probably happened in the last two to three years in, with all these states. Um, and you know, once you kind of organize your strategy around addressing affordability goals and, you know, begin to track those outcomes, it also allows you to begin to target highly burdened groups. Um, and this, too, is a, is a new way to direct policy or, or, or really aim for impact for those groups that are suffering from high energy costs. Um, and I here have a note that, you know, we, as we think through strategies um, well, we think through identifying highly burdened groups, I'm going to show you all a method for um, identifying those groups in your own community. We should also be thinking about how do we um, engage highly burdened households in developing policies and strategies um, to address 
efficiency and high energy costs, um, you know, that, that fits their needs and, and, and their housing stock. Um, you know, one way that, that states have begun to do this, we've seen both within kind of state energy um, sectors or spaces, um, as well as within the regulatory space, where the establishment of low-income program working groups, which brings together a variety of, of um, stakeholders to talk about the development of really good low-income programs. And I'll say we've, we've, over the last five, six years, have really began to identify best practices in terms of low-income program design, delivery, evaluation, um, and ensuring that they are really working to address the issue of high energy burdens. Um, also, we need resources, um, and we've seen some states complement their federal um, allocation of WAP or LIHEAP funding that can be used for efficiency. We've seen some states um, set savings or spending targets for the utilities in terms of um, ensuring that through their ratepayer-funded programs that they are reaching low-income households. We're seeing more and more of that each year, and it's a great way to ensure accountability and participation of low-income households. I want to a little bit more, I'd say, cutting edge and comprehensive is where we've seen some state directives to integrate energy, health, housing, um, funding, and resources. You know, they kind of started off this presentation. I said energy burden isn't just a product of the energy sector. It's related to housing. It's related to health. It's related to jobs. And until we really start addressing the problem collaboratively across sectors, I don't really think we're going to be able to tackle it in the way that needs to be. Um, and we've seen, I, I have here um, Washington State, New York State, um, both have great examples for how they um, fostered collaboration between specifically the healthcare sector and energy sector. Um, you know, the health outcomes of good energy efficiency upgrades um, are really, really um, impactful, and we're starting to see healthcare dollars pay for some of the efficiency upgrades for that reason. Um, and I'm not going to get too much um, into to this topic now because Tammy's going to talk about it in a second, but that is um, enabling access to um, accessible and fair financing options with the right consumer protection. We've seen some really innovative approaches. Tammy's going to talk about one to um, enabling a um, strategies and pathways for low-income households to access no or low-cost capital for efficiency upgrades. And as I mentioned early, earlier, we know a lot now about best practices for program design and delivery in this space. So very quickly before I pass it on to Tammy, I just want to note that um, oh, after I usually present this topic, especially to folks like yourselves, I get questions about, well, how can we measure energy burden in our state or locality? And I often didn't have a really good answer. This data isn't that publicly available. But in, in I think in the last year or two, DOE has released what um, is referred to as their low-income energy affordability data tool, the LEAD tool. And that is um, a wonderful tool for estimating energy burdens based on census tract and zip code data, and I think at the state level as well. Um, it's modeled data, but it's a great way to see differences across localities within a state and to, again, have that kind of bird's eye view of what areas or communities are worse off when it comes to energy burden. Um, they also have a bunch of resources available through their Clean Energy for Low-Income Communities Accelerator. They brought together um, a variety of stakeholders in this space and, and um, really focused on scaling up investments in low-income housing and um, also a strong focus on involving communities in policymaking and program design. And the same is true on the solar side. They have a national community solar partnership, which has really kind of pushed the envelope on um, strategies for advancing community solar. And just quickly, a little bit more on the LEAD tool. Um, it is a web-based interactive tool with um, national, state, as I mentioned, city, census tract level data. Um, and, it, and the goal of the tool is to help communities make data-driven decisions by improving the understanding of low and moderate income household um, and energy characteristics. So it's a great place to start. 
um, if you are looking to understand the energy burden landscape in your state. Um, they have one example here um, where in Kentucky they use the LEAD tool to identify um, neighborhoods or areas that face high energy burdens. And after doing that, they were able to target affordable housing grants for affordable housing to those areas. And so that's the way you could see kind of the lead tool being applied. And then here in the last slide, they also um, draw out a number of different use cases. Um, and one that's been notable, um, at least to me, in, in recent weeks, the New Jersey State Legislature introduced a new bill um, just a month or so ago to establish an Office of Clean Energy Equity. And they use the, the lead pool to um, really draw attention to the issue of energy burden in the state and, and serve a justification of, of creating this office. But otherwise, um, cities have used this tool, utilities have used this tool all to better identify burdened households and to track progress on investment. So I packed a lot in there. Um, hopefully I didn't talk too fast. Um, and I look forward to your questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. That was an excellent uh, introduction, I think, overview to a, a fairly complex topic, and I think really points out how many uh, folks across the nation are really impacted by high energy burdens in a slightly larger uh, percentage of our um, communities than, than we had previously um, previously thought. Um, and, and next up, is, is, as uh, Lauren mentioned, um, Tammy, uh, Igard will be presenting and discussing some of the uh, potential solutions and and kind of uh, actual um, upgrade uh, pathways for some of these challenged um, units that need uh, efficiency upgrades and how that can be financed. So uh, Tammy Igard uh, is CEO of EE Utility. Uh, she founded EE Utility in late 2014 determined to help low to moderate income families access the resources they need to make their homes energy efficient. Tammy specializes in energy relations and program management. So thanks uh, for joining us today, Tammy. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, Glenn, and thank you, Lauren, for that introduction, and as well as that tee up, Lauren, you did a good job of sort of positioning us to come in and provide some solutions here. I apologize to you out there seeing this first slide here. It's kind of hard to read, but it is. We didn't realize the background would be blue, but it's our, our company's name is Utility. Um, we are a B corporation located in Little Rock, Arkansas, and uh, our focus really has been for a while now to solve the problem, or or at least bring a very powerful tool um, to the you know, to the toolbox of solutions. Uh, to make sure that folks can access energy efficiency upgrades uh, in an equitable and all-inclusive manner. And so before I, I go to the next slide and, and let you all sort of enjoy a, a little video that, um, that we've prepared, I want to give you a little sort of insight into um, how we got to the conclusions that I'm presenting to you today. Um, personally, I have myself uh, Post Katrina, Hurricane Katrina, I have sat across from people who had not only lost uh, their homes and were living in trailers, I was qualifying them for energy efficiency services by looking at a variety of their personal information. And one of the things that I had to look at was the amount of income they had coming in next to the cost of you know, their their day-to-day -day lives. And one of those things that I had to look at was their energy, energy bills. And I saw firsthand uh, very vulnerable populations, uh, elderly, disabled, actually post-Katrina, these folks were even victims of contractor fraud, believe it or not. And I saw myself Social Security uh, bill or checks that were coming in for six or $700 a month and an energy bill that took up 100 plus percent of that, and I'm not talking about people who lived in McMansions or anything. I'm talking about people who lived in, you know, New Orleans-style thousand or twelve hundred square foot shotgun homes. And you know, I would scratch my head and look at these people across from me, and, and, and essentially, like, 
how do you eat? Right? How do you how do you pay for medicine? And the answers were essentially some sort of subsidized um, assistance, whether it was Meals on Wheels or or you know churches or some sort of government program. That was how they live and is how they live day to day. And it was that experience that really opened my eyes to this topic of energy burden. And it woke me up and it actually, it, it shocked me, it touched me, and it, and it challenged me to actually, absolutely dedicate the next 20 or 30 years of my working life, if I'm fortunate enough, to try to help tackle and bring a solution that is an all equitable solution um, for, for, for this most vulnerable demographic of folks. And so with that, I'm going to jump a little bit more to the present now and, and just tell you that uh, I don't know you, you don't know me. This is the first time I've ever had an opportunity to address people who have the potential power to change things from a state you know, legislative standpoint. And I have never in all my, you know, in my last 15 years of working on this issue, I have never been as encouraged, excited, and hopeful as I am now because of the pay-as-you-save system. And I can tell you firsthand, these people that I just described are getting help every day um, through through this program, and I'm excited to share it with you. So on that note, I am going to ask that uh, we go ahead and move on to the video. What if your home could be fixed up so that you're cool in the middle of summer and nice and warm in the dead of winter and you have more money every year for things you need? Your electric utility can make it possible. Here's how. First, they send a certified contractor to your home to see what energy efficiency improvements can be made to lower your electric bill. Then, your utility pays for improvements like replacing old energy guzzling equipment and sealing up your home or apartment against the heat and cold. You end up with a more comfy and healthy home and your electric bill goes down because you're not using as much energy. The utility recovers its costs for the upgrades through a charge on your bill, but the charge is less than the savings, so your bill is still lower. There are no loans, no credit checks, and no debt, and everyone can participate, even if you rent instead of own your place. If you move, the charges and the savings simply apply to the next folks moving in. Easy, right? It's called pay as you save. It's an on-bill financing model, and it's catching on with electric cooperatives leading the way. Call your electric utility today to ask if they provide home energy efficiency improvements financed on your electric bill. And if they don't, let them know it's time to start. Tammy, I think we can uh, proceed. Wonderful. Okay. Well, as the uh, as, as the last bit of the video was mentioning, there's an awful lot of success thus far in rural parts of the country. And hats off again to Lauren for mentioning that the rural energy burden is quite substantial. Um, that is that is true. In fact, 93% of persistent poverty counties in the United States overlap with rural electric cooperative service territories. Um, but I want to start this next slide off by letting you guys know a little bit of kind of fun news. Um, and that is, you know, what's coming right around the corner for the pay as you say system. So I can let you all know that uh, we will be launching a pays program for Georgia Power in the city of Atlanta in the middle of September. Um, This is just, you know, in the next couple months. Uh, We will be launching a uh, PAYS program pilot in the city of St. Louis for Ameren, Missouri, 
Uh, that is a um, $15 million program that's going to start in 2021. Uh, they are hoping and positioning the pay system to be their major energy efficiency program for all of their customers uh, by 2022, 23, and 24. So that's quite exciting. And then lastly, we are actively in late stage talks with the city of Minneapolis who sees the PAYS program as a absolute uh, kind of no-brainer way to bring equity and inclusion with respect to energy efficiency to the citizens of the city of Minneapolis. And in fact, right now in front of the Public Service Commission in the city of Minneapolis is a $50 million request from the city of Minneapolis to do a PAYS program. So uh, it is wonderful for rural electric cooperatives. We've had a great great bit of success. I, I kind of like to think we've been able to incubate the program and, and, and really hone in our service delivery of it, but I do want to make sure you all understand that this program, and that's one of the beauties about PAYS, it, it is not, it doesn't need to be operated by a certain type of utility or a for a certain type of customer base. Um, and it is an all-inclusive uh, financing program. So that means no one's left behind. And by leaving no one left behind, what that means is we actually are able to reach this low-income uh, demographic of, of folks, often disproportionately, who are African Americans, Native Americans, Latinos, um, and a, a vast many of those who are renters. So um, I can I can tell you firsthand that operating this all-inclusive uh, tariff on bill financing uh, model reaches everyone. It supports everyone who wants to participate. Uh, there are no subsidies required, meaning no one except for participants themselves are paying for the cost of the upgrades. They're just doing so over a, a period of time that enables the utility to do the investment, uh, secure that payment to the metered location, and then get that investment back over a long period of time at the meter so that the utility gets 100% cost recovery the consumer or the customer has to take on no debt at all. Uh, they simply pay a tariff charge at that meter location. Uh, that is 80% of the savings. So it also means that these folks, uh, whoever chooses to participate, are able to be cash flow neutral from, or mean positive, excuse me, from day one. And on average, by the way, that equates to about $25 a month left over in participants' pockets that they didn't have before they started the program. So there's no debt required, which means there's no credit check. There's no debt to income ratios. It doesn't matter if you're a homeowner or if you're a renter. It matters not how much money you make, um, your ability to take on debt. None of that matters. The only thing we look at is, is the structure you occupy likely to withstand the payback term, which averages about 10 years? And if the answer to that question is yes, then you are enrolled. And whatever the energy efficiency improvements that are cost effective um, that are available in your apartment or your home, those are what we do. It's, it's that simple. Um, so it's all inclusive. And because it's all inclusive, low income people finally, um, uh, folks who are disproportionately affected uh, and in this low income groups, again, African Americans, Native Americans, Latinos, um, single moms, these are the people who get the, the most help from this type of program. Um, and then lastly, I want to mention again, if I didn't cover it enough before I go to the next slide, that there are also no trade-offs. And what, what I mean by that is only people who participate in the program pay for the program, and they pay 100%. If you don't participate in the program, you don't pay for the program, and you are not subsidizing someone else's upgrade. Um, that, especially for you folks who are state legislators, should be interesting, I would think, because PAYS is not a red or a blue program. It is 100% sustainable. So how it works in a real simple graph uh, chart here, there is a capital provider, whether that is the utility with its own capital, such as the case in Georgia Power, such as the case in Ameren, Missouri. They've decided to use their own capital for this. 
um, they go ahead and and make that capital available um, for uh, you know any and all of its custom base base to use in order to access the energy efficiency improvements that are cost effective that they need where they live. Very simply, we define what those needs are. We go do an assessment, decide what those needs are. We work with local contractors, support local jobs, a diverse workforce, and we literally provide work orders to those contractors telling them what it is they need to do at that home. They go and do it. We pay them for it. And then over time, at that metered location, there is that tariff charge, which is 80% of the estimated savings. So the utility places a tariff charge back on that metered location that guarantees they are paid back, but again, at such a ratio that 20% of the estimated savings saves in the customer's pocket from day one. Very, very simple. So last slide before I turn it over to uh, Senator, Senator McClellan, I want to just hit real quick um, an attri some attributes, some of the highlighted attributes. Some of you on this call may have heard of the program called PACE. There's PACE Commercial out there or PACE Residential, Property Assess Clean Energy. That's the column on the far, far right. Many of you maybe have heard of a on-bill loan program where you're actually, you know, a, a utility might enable folks to do similar to what I'm talking about, but you're using normal credit um, you know, credit providers, um, normal capital providers like banks, et cetera. And, and for those, of course, you need qualifying and you need credit checks and you need home ownership and you need debt to income ratios and all the things that essentially eliminate 99% of the people we're trying to, to serve. And then, of course, on the far, on the, on the left side, you have the pay as you save or pays program. So I want to hit real quickly the ones on the top. Noticing, of course, next to on bill loan and pays, there are no check marks. So first and foremost, all customers, all building types are eligible, including renters. And by all customers and all building types, I'm talking about, again, renters, homeowners, single family, multifamily, uh, large commercial, industrial, municipal buildings, et cetera. If there is an energy efficient opportunity, you qualify. That's the qualifying determinant. Next, no credit checks, no credit scores necessary, no per personal debt, no property lien. You can see the check under the pay-as-you-save system. On-site energy assessment, utility bill, actual utility bill data from that location is what is used to determine the cost-effective approach to basically upgrade that location. Uh, estimated savings must exceed cost recovery charge. It's not okay to be debt neutral. It's not okay to flip-flop someone. You actually have to leave money in the participant's pocket. The customer earns the net savings immediately. Payments end if upgrades fail. You don't get that with an on-bill loan program. You don't get that in pays. If the upgrade that, was, that the utility invested in on your behalf fails, that payment to you ends until it's fixed. The opt-in is absolutely and totally and completely optional. No one is forced to do this program. You only do if you want to. If the participant leaves the location, so what? They leave behind the tariff charge and the new HVAC system. It doesn't follow you. So there's no debt hovering over you to leave. The cost recovery runs with the location, again, and it remains in effect and is there for subsequent customers who take over the tariff charge and also enjoy the savings, just like the occupant before them. The utility's investment is 100% secure. They do have the power to disconnect for failure to pay, but folks, it's a lower bill. It has to be. The utility cost recovery is through that fixed charge on the utility bill, and it stays with the utility until and only until the cost recovery is complete. Once it's done, it drops completely off. And some of the lower ones uh, on this list I want to hit real quick before I finish uh, that typically, in my experience, um, get in the way of low-income uh, people and, and, and people with diverse um, backgrounds have these hurdles in front of them to access energy efficiency um, and, and that is because usually they are they are renters oftentimes. Um, a lot of times they have to sign a promissory note or qualify for debt. 
all of these on on bill loan and the PACE program over here on the right, these are requirements that these programs typically have. And I'm telling all of you who are listening, these are why low income people and um, more diverse populations uh, are, are not able to access energy efficiency. So um, with that, I'm going to uh, go ahead and and uh, say thank you very much for your time and attention. And I look forward to hearing what Senator McClellan has to say and answering anyone's questions at the end of this. Thanks, Tammy. Um, that was an excellent uh, overview of, of a program that obviously you um, are very close to and, and have done some great work with. Um, and I'm sure we'll have some good discussion afterwards. Um, I just wanted to, uh, um, again, remind people, if you do have questions, you can type them into the audience chat. If we don't get to them today, we will um, try to um, get uh, our speakers also to respond to them afterwards. Um, but uh, with that, um, I want to introduce our final speaker, Senator Jennifer McClellan. Um, she served over 14 years as a uh, in the assembly in Virginia and before becoming a senator in uh, 2017. And she's been a leader in many areas, um, including energy and uh, energy efficiency policy. And she's going to speak about um, one of the uh, policies that she helped develop in Virginia and how uh, it's being implemented and some of the motivation behind it. So uh, let's welcome Senator McClellan. Thank you, uh, and thank you all for having me on this afternoon. Um, what I wanted to talk about tonight is, uh, or this afternoon, is Virginia this year passed the Virginia Clean Economy Act, and uh, it is a an extremely comprehensive uh, omnibus bill that really moves Virginia um, it does a number of things, but overall moves Virginia from towards the back of the pack of states as far as um, as as renewable standards, clean energy standards, uh, to one of the probably five or six countries in the nation. And and let me give you a little background of, of sort of the lay of the land in Virginia, um, which will help explain how significant this bill is. Uh, I've been in the legislature, uh, this was my 15th session, and every year uh, we had energy efficiency bills, renewable uh, standard bills, and and they never went anywhere. Um, and Virginia is a state where electric energy was predominantly generated by coal and natural gas. Um, we had very little solar or wind, uh, and all of the energy efficiency uh, programs were sort of self-generated by our investor-owned utilities, uh, and any efforts to put energy efficiency standards on them uh, very rarely got out of a, a subcommittee, let alone a full, full hearing in the House or the Senate, but a large number of stakeholders for many, many years uh, worked on this issue. And as we started to see um, the demand for addressing climate change increase, uh, and as we saw that with a transformative election, we were going to change the majority uh, and, 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 and at the same time that we were seeing more and more people demanding we have to address climate change overall. There was a coalition of advanced energy providers, um, technology companies, and, and purchasers of electricity, uh, environmental groups, public health groups, uh, energy efficiency groups, um, who really started to see we have to take a holistic approach um, to breaking Virginia's dependence on fossil fuels, but it had to also not only address the, the supply side of uh, electric generation, but the demand side. And if you didn't address both, um, then you would never really make progress. And so this bill um, put in place a clean energy target that by 2045, uh, we would be 100% carbon free 
Um, and between now and then, by 2030, at least 30 percent of our electric generation uh, would, would be carbon-free and renewable. Um, we also uh, removed barriers to solar and offshore wind. Um, but for you know, a particular relevance to this panel, um, we added energy savings targets for our investor-owned utilities. Um, and basically, we said that for, for Dominion, which is our um, largest, uh, our largest investor-owned utility, they had a target where 5% uh, of the total retail sales in, in 2025 would have to be uh, the, the product of sort of energy, efficient, energy efficiency programs and efforts. Um, and then for Appalachian Power, which covers the western part of the state, um, they had to reach 2% by 2025. And the utilities can use a wide variety of, of measures um, to get those savings. Um, and our state corporation commission um, sort of will, will oversee how those um, targets are, are met. The, the SEC will then set new three-year targets in 2026 and every three years after that. Um, and so um, um, that is that is sort of an overall view. Uh, the bill is is in the process of of sort of being um, looked at by our state corporation commission to to see exactly what process they will process they will use to set those targets. Um, but it was really important to us that if we were going to uh, really break our our dependence on fossil fuels, we had to do it in a way that allowed the electric companies to keep the lights on. And part of that was you have to reduce demand. And so um, that's why we were very intentional. And, and, and we had tried piecemeal every other year to say we'd have an energy efficiency bill, we'd have a renewable generation bill, we'd have a bill to remove barriers to solar, we would have a bill to expand access to wind, we would have a bill to increase uh, electric, um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, storage, energy storage, and we'd have a separate bill to do environmental justice, which is another component of the VCEA where we, for the first time, uh, make environmental justice a public policy of, of the Commonwealth. Um, we, we tried for probably somewhere between 11 to 15 years to do all of those piecemeal. I think what made this so successful was we took a holistic approach and said, this is really all, you know, these are all different stools, different legs of the same stool, and they have to work together. And, and so, um, and then bringing a broad coalition of not just environmental groups, not just advanced energy groups, not just uh, organizations and stakeholders focused on energy efficiency, um, but, but all of them working together, uh, that really made the difference with this bill. Great. Well, thanks so much, uh, Senator McClellan. That was a really good overview of um, some actual legislation that has helped uh, create and drive um, affordability measures um, through energy efficiency. Um, again, we, we do have time to take some, some Q&A, and I want to thank all our speakers, of course, um, again, but uh, we do have time for some Q&A, and I have a number of questions that have, have come in, so I'll, I'll pose those to uh, our presenters um, now. So uh, the first question, actually, is for, for Lauren. Um, how can the implementation of energy codes help reduce the energy burden for vulnerable populations? Sure. Um, well, I, I think, I mean, any usually upgrade, right, to the housing stock um, would, would I, any efficiency upgrade to the housing stock would improve energy performance, thereby reducing energy costs. Where I think the biggest opportunity here, um, beyond just single family, but where we, you know, may, may see new buildings and, and codes come into effect as well, um, would be the multifamily housing stock and the affordable existing multifamily housing stock, um, which 
it's traditionally hard to reach in this space, but I even hesitate saying that because the field itself has come a long way. There's innovative financing for affordable multifamily units. Um, there's a larger issue there in terms of code enforcement and resources for code enforcement and technical assistance for upgrading and that. Um, but I think, I don't know if this is where the question was really going, but I think a great opportunity would be the, you know, targeting um, renovation and, and um, upgrading in the existing affordable multifamily housing stock, which has major implications um, for low-income households and is greatly in need of efficiency. Great, thank you. And uh, a second question that came in, are there good examples, I guess this, is, this could be for, for anyone who might know any of our presenters, are there any good examples of state or local governments putting uh, a practice in place whereby landlords and property managers are required to disclose energy costs um, to uh, those who, who may be renting or, or leasing the uh, space? And whether, sure. whether the disclosure is, is a feature of the um, building or unit. Sure. Um, this is Lauren again. Others feel free to jump in too. I saw the question, so I did a little bit of research as, as the rest of the presenters were presenting. Um, what came to mind was Chicago and Austin. Chicago seems like the best example where there is, pretty sure I, I put a link to it in the chat too, where landlords have to declare disclose heating costs. Um, obviously, in Chicago, that makes a lot of sense. Um, in, um, in Austin, landlords of multifamily buildings have to post energy audit, the, ener the results of an energy audit, and then their, their building is rated in terms of efficiency. So it doesn't really translate to energy costs, but you get a sense of efficiency and energy performance of a building. Um, I will say, you know, I like to think that policy is moving in that direction. We're seeing more home energy disclosure policies come up and the kind of time of sale, um, tying it to time of sale and real estate listings. Um, but the rental piece specifically, which he's asking, um, not totally there yet, but I think Chicago is a good example or the closest example we have. Well, well thank you. Um, this, this next question, I believe, is, is for Tammy, um, and I guess we'll just have to, to since it is 2 p.m., we'll, we'll wind up, uh, close out with this question. And again, just a reminder, this is being recorded, so you'll be able to um, listen to the recording of the webinar and share it with folks afterwards. But uh, to Tammy, do, uh, for, your, for the uh, PACE program, do landlords need to sign off? And... Um, kind of uh, part of that as well, are there measures that prevent property owners from effectively capturing the benefits um, through raising rents? So what we cannot do is go in and, and try to control rents, but what very few facilities have done, and it's worked really well, as a matter of fact, it's happening right now in LaGrange, Georgia, if anyone wants to poke around there. Um, uh, landlords have been asked by the city mayor to make a public pledge that should, in the case of LaGrange, Georgia, for example, should the city, which is a municipally owned utility, invest in energy efficiency in, uh, in, in single family renters or multifamily renter properties, that the landlords make a pu very public, public pledge uh, saying that they would actually freeze rates for X amount of time in exchange for the utility making those investments. Um, and, and we think that's a fantastic, um, you know, absolutely fantastic uh, w way to go. Um, and so I hope that answers that question. With respect to um, people themselves, tenants, um, remember, no matter if you're the homeowner or the tenant, the bill has to be lower, which means that the only cost-effective um, investments are allowed to go into that uh, structure. And so through an energy audit and utility usage history at that location, um, that is how we determine the most, that's what utility specials in, we specializes in, we determine the most cost-effective scope of work for that uh, home or apartment or, or building. And, uh, and then the only time the contractor is engaged is when we, we literally hand them a job and say, here, this is what you need to do here. These are the tasks. Geocoded and timestamp photos are loaded to our 
to our uh, tracking platform so remotely we can do 100% QC and make sure that only what we've authorized is what's been, is what's been uh, installed. And again, those are cost-effective installations by a strategy. So it's not like there are contractors, um, no offense meant, but it's not like there are contractors going out and, and determining what is the cost-effective scope of work for this house. It is building science building scientists, energy analysts who are determining what that strategy is and then simply giving the job to the contractor. Well, thank you. Thanks, Tammy. And I, I really want to extend a final thanks to all of our presenters who have taken time um, out, of their, out of their day um, to share their expertise with you and um, provide, hopefully, um, some information that you can uh, utilize as, as you go about uh, addressing this, this um, I think, growing and very important issue. And uh, of course, I want to thank our attendees as well for participating, so thank you. Um, and uh, as a reminder, uh, the recording of today's webinar and the presentation slides will be made available soon, and we will send out an email uh, noting that. So um, you, I wish you all a great day, and we hope to see you or actually hear from you on our next webinar. Be well. Thanks, everyone.